This is Dave once again from the Wolves Den saying, Happy Tuesday. It's time for AIR Radio. And Jennifer Hillman will be back in just a few minutes with her guest. Hello, everyone. Jennifer Hillman, and this is Abstract Illusions Radio here on Spirit Radio. And I am pleased as to have an amazing writer of many, many wonderful books, but today I'm mainly talking about one of his award-winning books, The Infinite Zone. This is Matthew Palomari, and welcome to the show, Matt. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, thank you. I appreciate you having me on the show. Now, how many books have you written? Hello, everyone. We took a little break to make the sound quality, the audio a little clearer, rebooted everything, and now we're back on with Matthew Palomari. And we asked a question from the chat of what is the role of psychedelics in shamanism? It's... Uh if anybody has spent any time looking at any of my work, it's one of my favorite subjects. Um, I'll give myself just a little plug here first before I delve into that. My memoir, Spirit Matters, um, is my journey through the psychedelic path, uh, finding my spirituality from a place of really no spirituality in the inner city of Boston. Uh, into the jungles of the Amazon where I really found my spirituality. So there are a number of things about uh, psychedelic shamanism that really go back to prehistoric times. It is a big part of uh, history. But one little caveat I want to say is that uh, this has been my path. But it's not necessarily the path for everybody. People can find their way uh, meditating, uh, doing different things, and uh, it, it gets into my passionate love of altered states. And people don't realize it, but we actually go through our lives, even somebody who considers themselves to be um, straight, so to speak, or, you know, not taking anything, it's still, you know, sleep is an altered state, dreaming is an altered state, if you drink coffee and you get a little buzzy, it's an altered state. Uh, all these things change your consciousness. And the whole idea of uh, psychedelic shamanism has to do with uh, altered states of consciousness as modes of learning. So the, the primary uh, idea is working with the plants. And as they say in the Amazon and South American Indian uh beliefs, the plants are the teachers. Mm -hmm. So you learn by uh, altering your consciousness different modes of being and different modes of perceiving. And then once you start to learn those things, then your consciousness can become expanded. But it has to be done, you know, most of what I do now, uh, if not really all of it, is done within a context of... Uh, a setting, and it's a, uh, a safe therapeutic setting done with, you know, guides and uh, people to oversee things. It's not like, let's just all go out and get whacked out of our gourds. It's not that at all. It's about digging into the subconscious. So if we have our normal waking consciousness, what I call baseline consciousness, and then we alter that with a substance, then we're going to see the world in a different way a novel way. And when you go into some um, deep altered states, initially it can be quite overwhelming and it can be quite terrifying. But each time you return, you learn a little bit more about that state of being. And then the key, which a lot of people don't get, is when you come back to, to baseline consciousness, you need to spend time integrating what you've learned and experienced. Um, a lot of people don't think that way. And I always like to say that in many ways, the time between altered states is more important than the time in them because you learn. So um, I like the analogy of the brain being a radio receiver. And if you're on one dial, let's say I was very religious, 
very stuck, and everything was just one thing, then that's all I would know, and I wouldn't have any concept. And if I thought, oh, gee, somebody's into shamanism or altered states, and I could judge them and block them out, I just blocked out that whole realm of experience that has validity, which is actually what happened when, when the Western uh, Europeans came to the New World and they were persecuting shamans for going to the visionary states, um, which is actually, that's the theme of my uh, historical novel, Land Without Evil, which has to do with all about shamanism. But there's a whole realm of experience, and this gets back to uh, shamanism uh, being based on direct experience. So if you take, and, and, and I want to also make another caveat in saying that not all substances are good. You know, cocaine is not good, heroin is not good, you know, methamphetamine. And, and then, of course, there's uh, tons and tons of legal drugs, like, you know, found in antidepressants. All those things are not good. But the, the basis of psychedelic shamanism has to do with plants, and the plants have to do with prehistoric systems of belief and uh, psychology and psychotherapy that go way, way back, you know, literally uh, prehistoric times, which is the traditions that I've been working in have been uh, literally prehistoric traditions. So if you're tightly focused in on one point on the radio dial, then you only know that station. You know, if you're just always listening to an AM station of rock and roll, that's all you're never going to know. You're never going to know about classical music. You're never going to know about jazz or other things because you're just stuck on that one station. So when you get into an altered state, you can go off the dial for a while to another station, and then you come back to baseline again, and you can integrate what you've learned in that state. Now, you can take another substance and go to another radio station, or you can take a substance... Uh, like the, the one I've worked with the most is ayahuasca, which is in the Amazon. Most people have heard of that, and I can elaborate more on that in a bit if, if need be. Ayahuasca is unpredictable, which is one of the things I like about it. And when you drink ayahuasca, it opens up your subconscious, and all your fears come up. So then if you try to run or fight with it, it just gets worse. It really has a way of finding your deepest fears and amplifying them. But if you learn to face them and you realize that you took this substance in order to face that fear, then you realize it has something to teach you, and you learn to re-experience it. One of, one of the modalities of healing was, you know, you talked a little bit about Chiron and the Wounded Healer. Well, the basis of the Wounded Healer is to uh, discover your own wounds and heal them. And in healing your own wounds, then you have the ability to heal others because you know. It gets back to what I said earlier about you could be judging somebody for a particular behavior or habit, and then you realize that it's within you. And then when you start to catch it within yourself and you face it finally and realize where it comes from and how deep it goes, then you have uh, compassion. And so it really expands outward like that in a healing way. So when you go through these uh, experiences uh, time and again, you're really dredging the depths of your subconscious, and you're looking at things from different ways. If you take one substance, you could be looking at it through one window in the room of who you are. Uh, as I said in my first book, you know, The Small Dark Room of the Soul, uh, if you look at it through the room, you're getting another perspective. So when you take different substances that are known to have uh, spiritual slash therapeutic qualities, what you're doing is, is you're shifting your perspective in a number of different ways. And when you look at different things in a number of different ways, to me personally, that's what I call insight because you've seen it from every which way you can imagine. And then when you have somebody uh, doing something, you can have some comprehension of it and some understanding of it. When, when you look at some of the things, some of the things I've seen, some of the darkness things I've seen, when I see horrible things like uh, terrorists, like what happened with the Boston Marathon, well, part of me is revolted and, you know, almost ashamed to be human, but the other part of me has compassion because they understand how somebody can get so far off from uh, any compassion or reality to do something so horrible, to, to, you know, to hurt innocent people. 
And it's all because they're in their own pain. There's, right. there, there's a whole, you know, idea of that. So well, it's a really powerful method of uh, exploration. And, and when I do it in the jungle, I do it um, usually over the period of a 10-day, very restricted, uh, they call it dieta. And um, when you, I'll, I'll finish this part and then I'll let you pick up again. But when you, when you do a dieta like that, you go on a very restricted diet. And I, typically I'll do five uh, sessions of ayahuasca with a shaman during a 10-day period, and I'll work with a number of other plants during that time. And what happens during that period is is your your uh, physical body gets weaker, and your subconscious comes up, and the boundaries mm-hmm. between your conscious and your subconscious become blurred, and your schedules are all off because you don't have a schedule, and you're mostly alone, so you can sleep during the day and be up half the night. And lots of things come up in your dreams and your visions, and sometimes they work together. And you discover what's deep down in your subconscious, and then you're there by yourself, so you have to deal with it. You can't, can't blame anybody or project it on anybody because you're with yourself. And the, the whole concept of that is, is a purification. It's a purification diet, and it's a purification and refinement. And it ties in with what you said a little while ago, Jennifer, uh, about right now, in my humble opinion, during this time, everything is moving quicker. The energies are moving quicker. And I see it uh, shamanically as more or less a purification by fire. And, you know, oh. fire, is it, 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 it's, it's energy moving very quickly. Yeah, and it's burning up a lot of things. And we do have a caller, if you're ready to have a question. Yes. Okay. Um, Area code 917, you are on. What is your first name, and what city are you calling from? Hi, Jennifer and Matthew. This is Bob Yaling. Hey. Hey, Bob. Hey, how are you? Great. And what's your question or comment, Bob? Um, Matthew, my question for you is, um, my my question for you is, how... When we write, when we write, we sometimes, when we get into so-called creative dream, it's like an altered state in in and of itself. And I was wondering um, how equivalent that might be to an altered state from a uh, from a hallucinogenic, uh, such as ayahuasca, in the way we, you know, bring out our material and also in the way that um, we perceive what we're writing. Great question. That question is so great, I'm getting goosebumps. So let me say a couple of things. Um, one is that um, my, my goal personally throughout my writing career has been to take uh, an altered state or altered states which are non-rational experiences and to put them in a way where somebody who would never be crazy like me and go take all these plants and substances and be able to maybe get some sense of the experience that I have had and I'm trying to convey. Now, this applies not just to all the states, but it applies to dramatic writing overall. And like in the case, you know, writing a novel. You, if you do the novel correctly, then you have, in essence, uh, the hero's journey. And you get to live vicariously through the hero to get that experience. So um, my struggle has been to take those non-rational states and put them in a way that people can comprehend. And this is the key that I have come across. And the key is metaphor. Metaphor is magical. And when you go into altered states, like particularly with ayahuasca, you have what's called synesthesia. Everybody probably knows what synesthesia is, but I'll just say it really briefly. Synesthesia is when senses cross. So you can actually see color. Um, I'm sorry, not see color, hear color and see sound. And there are other things that happen with people. Some people have a natural, they call them synesthetes, but it's synesthesia. So you learn to take something that's, you know, and in the essence of a metaphor is to take one thing that's different from another and make the connection to get the concept across. So when you get into the visionary states and you begin to explore the different realms that are out there, um, you start to figure and you start to understand archetypes. 
And archetypes are, are basic, what I like to think of as cosmic universal concepts. And they, um, they say it's one thing, one symbol, one concept that says a whole lot more. It's far deeper. It's a very deep, deep, deep symbol. The, the deepest symbols of our culture are archetypes. You know, the basic ones are, are like mother and father, uh, sun and moon, you know, black and white, black and black. But the whole idea of the cross, which, you know, is a big Christian symbol, it's, well, it's universal throughout other cultures, even in, in really remote South American Indian tribes. And a lot of the deeper meaning of the cross has to do with the, the meaning of time and, and space. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, the ecliptic across the sky, and then there's, they call the, the axis, when you the world, it goes up to heaven and down to earth, which, and we are, as humans, we are the nexus of that. So when you're uh, navigating these different uh, states, then you start to learn how your, uh, your consciousness flows. And the other thing that happens when you're doing it, this is more, more so with ayahuasca than other ones, is you really learn to, uh, to see what your ego is. And when you understand the chatter and the noise that comes from the ego, which uh, I read somewhere and I love to think of it as, a, as a, uh, basically a, a chatter monkey, but also it should be treated as a favorite pet because it's trying to do you good. But when you learn to set that aside, I think then you get to the deeper aspects of yourself. And I think when you connect with uh, the deeper aspects of yourself and you're connecting with, with your heart energy, and when your heart energy starts to come through, then I think the writing, even though it's always hard work, on one level it becomes effortless and it really starts to, to, to mm -hmm. flow. And... The best work that I've done, uh, personally, the stuff has written itself. Mm -hmm. I, uh, when I finished Land Without Evil, the historical novel, I literally finished it in a fever. It was writing itself. And, and my latest book, The Infinity Zone, literally wrote itself. You, I know both you guys, I'm familiar with both of uh, you guys' writing, and both of you guys are uh, what I like to say, call uh, heartfelt writers. So you are tapped in, and I think when you do these substances, I know particularly for me with, with the ayahuasca, uh, it's allowed me to connect more with my heart. And so when I'm coming from my heart as opposed to my mind, then it's more genuine. It's more what I like to call a higher centered. It's less egocentric. And I think it's a cleaner message, you know, a, a more pure message. So uh, writing... When you really get into it, when you're a disciplined writer and, you know, sit down and really do the work, that in itself is indeed an altered state. I, I found myself struggling with a piece and working on it and working on it, and then all of a sudden I look up and, like, three hours have gone, and I've got two pages. And I'm like, wow, how did that happen? It's, it's really a magical thing. Uh, writing is an act of creation, and an act of creation is, uh, in essence, what uh, shamanism is all about. We are all creators. We we rule the world. The, the world that we create in the novels and the dramatic writing that we do, um, we are the gods and goddesses of that world, and we're in charge. And what we say, if we're on the, the, the path in the way I'm talking about, then what we're doing is, in essence, uh, reflecting and expressing our truth. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that's a good answer. I kind of jumped around a little bit there. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for answering that question, Matthew, and this is a great show, by the way. Oh, thank you. Is there anything else you want to ask, Bob, since you're on? Um, no, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's I great hearing from you, and thanks for calling in. Mm, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, my, uh, something else I want to add to what you were saying, Matthew, is about the writing and being the creator within um, that world. I also like to think of it as um, another timeline I've written, I've lived, that I'm reflecting on the page. And a lot, at least for me, a lot of the things I'm writing are aspects of me that I'm getting better acquainted with and putting on the page. And it's like an introduction to myself that I'm reflecting. Yes. Um, me, myself, I, I haven't delved into the plant aspect of shamanism I've studied the herbs but yet I haven't experienced them as you have I'm, I'm more the dream um, time and um, and very much the meditation and also just being 
very present and still and, and just asking a question and letting spirit just kind of flow through me. Um, I've, I've been in touch with this part of me um, and really allowed it to come out since I was a kid. So um, as I like to say, I came in this world with the light switch on <laughs> where, and the dim are pretty high up. So um, although I would like to experiment with some, I really would like to have somebody with me that has the experience. Um, mm-hmm. So because of the fact that I have delved into shamanic work through connecting with animals versus mm-hmm. herbs. And I connected um, when I was doing a shamanic apprenticeship with a shaman, um, with a raven. And the raven took me in to see my greatest fears. And it was interesting to find that my greatest fear was actually being like my sister because of it. And as soon as I found that out, it's like part of me resisted it. But as soon as I let go, I lived through it and saw the beauty of the way she is instead of fearing it, understanding that the freedom she found within it. There's parts of it I understand better because I face my fears and understanding. And even with that same meditation, I face my death. Um, That was very physical. It was very purifying and and it was beautiful. So I, I really have no fear of death whatsoever, which I think is really helpful for everyone to to experience it in that sense because it's so freeing. Yeah, I, um, I, I agree. Now, somebody asked a question, and I want to make sure she gets the full answer. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of times when people are using psychedelics, they tend to lose control. And yeah. sometimes the fears are, like, overwhelming. What is the best way to prepare for this and adjust to the situation of losing control and just following the flow? Okay, there's a couple of things that are important there. That's a very good question. One is that, and you you also said it when you were sort of leading into this, is that nobody should ever do anything of that nature in any way, shape, or form unless they have a competent and experienced guide. Um, A good friend of mine, Jim Fadiman, wrote a book called The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. I think it's been out about a year now. And he talks about protocols for uh, doing that kind of thing. Now, when I go into the jungle and I work with the ayahuasca uh, and I work with a shaman, we are, we sit, we do it in a circle in a ceremony. So we're in that circle. The shaman is presiding over it. And there are people very close by who don't partake of anything. So they're like a connection to the outside world, the outside baseline reality, whatever you want to call it. So it's safe. So you, in a proper setting with a competent shaman or or healer person or guide, whatever you want to call them, can be in a, what we call a container, a safe container where you can lose your mind and go a little nuts but you have basically, and we call them sitters, you have sitters who watch you so you don't hurt yourself, but you go through. A lot of the, the, the wounds go very deep into um, the instinctual center, and that goes, a lot of them go back actually to traumas of birth. So um, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Stanislaus Groff who did a lot of research, uh, I think it started back in the late 40s with LSD, as a psychiatrist uh, in Czechoslovakia, if I remember correctly. And then, um, of course, that got outlawed. But he moved forward with his research and discovered a thing that is you can discover if you, uh, if you search, even Google it. It's called holotropic breathing. And he learned by doing this holotropic deep breathing thing that you can go back to those states, the same states that people were... Uh, getting into uh, doing LSD. And he traced our traumas, and this is wrong true for me, uh, all the way back to uh, what he calls the perineal matrices. And the perineal matrices are four of them. Number one, you're in the womb, you're in amniotic bliss, you're connected to mom, everything is wonderful and expansive and beautiful and, and everything. 
And then all of a sudden, one day, your world collapses and your environment is poisoned by hormones and all that. And that's perinatal matrix number two. Then number three, you get squeezed into the birth canal and you get even more constricted and more, you know. And remember, I said earlier, uh, uh, love is expansion and fear is contraction. So you're at this point. And then, of course, number four, you're blasted out into the whole new world. Now, those are very basic and primal experiences. And when you get down to the deepest uh, fears that you have, the fears that your ego is protecting you from, those all tie in to uh, the instinct. And the instinct is about survival. So even though you may have habits and patterns and subpersonalities and wounds that are now screwing you up, when you were younger, you were coping with things, and that's how you learn to cope with it. So it's a defensive mechanism. Um, it's also interesting, too, and, and, and what I'm going to say right now is really a generalization, but I want to make this generalization, and it's, and it's this. As a rule, as a general rule, men are intellectually centered, and women are more emotionally centered or heart-centered. So I know many, many women who are already there. They're in touch with their intuition. So as you said, I forget exactly how you worded it, but you said something like you came in and you already had this openness. Right. I had the um, the light switch was on, the dimmer was in. Because I think of yeah. um, intuition as you can turn it all the way on, you can turn it down, you have control of and of the filterings of the information you're getting from spirit. Yeah, light switch on. I love that. So so I'm going to share my personal experience um, to to sort of, brighten all this up or clarify it more is probably a better way to put it. And it's this. I grew up in a tough neighborhood. I grew up in uh, Dorchester in Boston. Uh, Marky Mark, Mark Wahlberg, uh, he comes from my same neighborhood. I was older than him. But tough neighborhood. I was uh, always a littlest kid, so I got in a lot of fights, a lot of stuff. Okay. I had no feminine side. And I went for 30 years of my life without ever crying. And it wasn't like I'm not going to cry or anything. It just wasn't there. It was like non-existent. When I started working with uh, the plant medicines, actually particularly ayahuasca, I reconnected with my feminine. And I went through a period of somebody could just say one thing to me and I'd start bawling. You know? Uh, I remember... uh, deep into it, I got a call from my mom one day, and it was my birthday, and she goes, happy birthday, honey, and I just started bawling, it was so sweet, and I'm like, and she's like, well, 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 what's the matter, honey, are you okay, and I'm like, oh, and then she says, well, does this have anything to do with those plants you're working with, and I'm like, yes, and she's like, okay, well, just have a good cry, and then, you know, get yourself together, and then I did. And I went through a year or two of that being highly emotional. And then the most amazing thing happened. My intuition skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. It's like I had no intuition. And when I reconnected, because that was the part of me, my shadow, that was repressed. And so when I connected with that part of me and that uh, feeling that I was really denying and protecting and sheltering, my intuition just went through the roof. And then I started having more uh, telepathic experiences, you know. So it's been quite the journey. And then I came to realize that our heart is really our center, our brain. You know, our culture, particularly males, and again, this is a generalization, we go by our brains and our intellect, and we try to control our world by our brains. But the heart is actually a superior organ. And, and I believe that you shift from being intellectually slash ego-centered to becoming heart-centered. And that means acknowledging your uh, feminine, uh, and this has nothing to do with sexuality, but uh, acknowledging that feminine, bringing it back into yourself, and then you become, in my humble opinion, a more balanced being because you have your intellect and your intuition, and you get uh, a balance between the two. Uh, uh, another thought, and then I'll stop and let you go again. But, um, interesting thing that happens with ayahuasca. Okay, when we're awake, 
during our day, we are primarily, especially males, intellectually centered. And we don't listen to that side of ourselves. Women listen to it more. Now, when we go to sleep at night, our intellectual left brain gets a rest, and our right brain comes out to play. And that's when we have dreams. And the language of the right brain is more symbolic. That's why dreams can be so bizarre. But if you really study your dreams intensely, you'll find that there's a very deep, deep, deep archetypes and symbols that are in the dreams. And the language of the right brain is more of a dreaming, visual, conceptual, as opposed to, you know, logical, mathematical, intellectual. So uh, in the opening of my memoir, Spirit Matters, the opening chapter, I think, is called A Waking Dream. And the mm -hmm. reason it's called that is because what happens in ayahuasca is your right brain gets turned on and your left brain is still on. So both sides of your brain are going and you have what I call a waking dream. And then, you know, people who are very, very much intellectually centered really struggle with that because they start losing control because the right brain isn't is non rational. It's more in, intuitive, which isn't doesn't follow a straight line. But um, the people who are very much intellectual struggle with that and will have the hardest time figuring things out. But if you understand that part of part of the intuitive side and part of the feminine is to be uh, receptive and not controlling, then you have a better experience and you learn to integrate the two sides of your brain. And I think that's a big deal. I think we're very off balance as a culture. Well, obviously, we're off balance. Look at what's going on around us. Well, and, uh, and I'm, I'm just finding that there are a lot of women that are even having trouble getting in touch with the feminine or the goddess essence within them because they've been trying to work in the man's world. So they really had to put on that masculinity and that toughness and um, be the money winner when a big part of them is crying out for that balance. And I think it's now women are beginning to, um, and society in generally is trying to find where that balance is because we've gone to one extreme or the other. Yeah, I agree. We've been we've been more divided, except I, I, but I think we're approaching a more of a balance point in the past, you know, number of years. Yeah, um, it, it's it's it will be interesting to see how society shifts. Right now, I agree with you. We're, we're testing through fire. We're walking through a very intense time to kind of like put up or shut up kind of thing. And I'm not surprised of how many. Um, people are deciding um, I'm done with this and deciding to go to the other side. Um, I, I feel like there's so many people that they've had enough and they really are leaving to the other sides in leaps and bounds. Um, and a lot of, and, and it's only making room for more energy to come in. So it's an interesting time. I wanted to ask you, are you familiar with um, Stuart Wilde's work at all? I'm not sure. Um, he does a lot of stuff with Awaska as well, and he talks about um, the Shimmering Door, which is a 26-dimensional portal, which he got with using Awaska. And I was just wondering if you had any kind of experience with seeing multiple dimensions at one time because of your experimentation. Yes, um, one of the I've had some really exquisite, exquisite and sublime experiences on ayahuasca, as well, along with some um, hellish ones. But um, one of the and one of the things about it is you can't make any of these things happen. Like when I have a telepathic experience, I can't make it happen. I can't be ooh, I know you're thinking about having a hamburger tomorrow or anything like that. It just happens. And mm -hmm. you know when it happens, because it happens along the lines with um, uh, synchronicities. So one of the wonderful experiences I've had is uh, what they call bilocation, mm -hmm. which is I've, I've been in two completely different places, fully at aware of both at the same time. And it, and it, and it, yeah, and it's been, it's probably happened to me maybe half a dozen times, and it's been truly a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um Another thing which ties in with this that drew me to ayahuasca is that there is an agreed-upon uh, psychological landscape. So 
uh, no matter where you are, you could be in New York City, you could be in the Amazon, you could be in China, and if you drink ayahuasca, you'll pretty much always see snakes, and more often than not, you'll see jaguars. And it doesn't mm -hmm. matter where you are geographically, it's an agreed upon um, uh, landscape. And I've actually seen it in ayahuasca art. Um, there's a, a famous ayahuasca painter. He passed away, I think, about four or five years ago. He was a, a friend uh, by the name of Pablo Amaringo. And I knew Pablo real well, and I visited his studio. He had a painting school in the Amazon. And I came back one time from an ayahuasca dieta, and I had seen these beings. And I walked into Pablo's studio, and he was showing me his latest painting, and I saw the beings that I had seen in my visions in his paintings. And I looked at him, and I pointed, and he looked, and he looked at me, and our eyes met, and, and his eyes lit up, and, I, and he realized that I got it, and I got him, and we got each other, and we understood that we sh had shared that vision. So there, there, like there's a there's a place they talk about often called the Crystal Castles. Mm -hmm. I've visited there a number of times, and it's one of the most sublime, uh, exquisite high points of my whole existence. Frankly, it's profoundly beautiful, painfully beautiful, to where it's like I don't even think I can take anymore. It's so beautiful, and um, it's a shared realm. And I think, uh, in my experience, when you go through different levels, every time when I thought, okay, I'm not going to do ayahuasca anymore, I think I've learned everything it's going to teach me, boom, I get shown something new. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I used to do lots of things when I was younger, but the more I've worked with the ayahuasca, the less I'm really interested in other things. Because um, it is a, uh, for lack of better words, it's a more pure uh, path. And it has a very distinctive uh, agenda. To me, it's actually the voice of Mother Earth speaking directly to me. That's how I interpret it. And um, in shamanic thought and psychological thought, you know, that we, I talked a little bit about archetypes. And ayahuasca uh, is a feminine. It's considered the dark feminine, which is important. It, it, it truly is. Um, now, my question to you, have you ever had an experience on ayahuasca and really didn't want to come back from it, that it yeah. almost haunted you when you came out of it? Well, um... You know what I, I mean? Say, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if I'd say haunted, but uh, there's a couple of things that have happened to me. One was... Uh, I was confronting death and um, non-existence, for lack of a better word. And I kept finding myself terrified at the edge of the abyss. And what happened is it came into my dreams, and it did haunt me in my dreams, and kept coming back for me in my dreams and terrifying me. And, you know, I'd wake up in cold sweats and all that. And then, but it kept coming back for me. So uh, at one point, I was in a dreaming state. It was very lucid. And I was at the edge of the abyss, and I was terrified. And I had the thought, wait a minute. What are you so afraid of? Okay, so if you cease to exist, you cease to exist. So I went into the abyss, and I ceased to exist. And God only knows. It could have been milliseconds. It could have been a minute. I had no idea. It was timeless. But all of a sudden, I came back. And I was like, wow, that wasn't so bad. And then, boop, I went off again, and then I came back. And then I popped myself in and out, and what I had originally so mortally feared so deeply, I came to love and embrace. And it opened up a, a whole new doorway for me. And, of course, once I did that, all those other dreaming things went away. Mm -hmm. There are, typically, when I have a journey, uh, I'll pick a particular thing, that stands out, and I and I almost make it as a snapshot because when you have any experience, things happen often very, very, very quickly, and it's often when it's happening incomprehensible. Where people get into trouble is where they struggle to try to figure it out then and there, and you can't. You really got to let go and just follow the journey, and then the next day, 
in the days and the weeks that follow, then you can figure out what's happening. But when we do our sessions, what we do is we will meet the next morning and have an integration, and we'll all talk about our experience. Mm -hmm. And that helps with the integration. But there are some places, man, I mean, I, I, not that long ago I had an experience where I was literally went through the birth canal and I was birthed into heaven. And it was so beautiful. Um, it was beautiful. It was so beautiful and intense and bright that it was painful and it was beautiful. And part of me never wanted it to end ever. And another part of me was like, I don't know how much more of this light I can take. So, okay. you know, they're there. They're oh, there. Definitely. So a uh, yeah. question in the chat room is, any shaman or treatment that you would recommend in visiting Peru um, for taking ayahuasca? Is there any place well, certain that you suggest people connect with? Um, it, it, are you talking people or a geographical place or both? Oh yeah, well, there's lots throughout South America, which is one of the things that drew me to it. And the Peruvian Amazon has been um, the best for me. There's a uh, a, um, I think if you were to Google Jose Campos, he has a website, and he's done some uh, good, reputable work. Also, for explore, just exploring shamanism overall, there's Power Path Seminars. And um, I had actually done a two-year shamanic study course with them, where I traveled throughout South America and the southwestern United States and um, experienced different, you know, I haven't just worked with ayahuasca. I've also worked with uh, uh, San Pedro, which is called Huachuma in the Andes. Um, I've worked throughout the southwestern United States. Um, I did the whole uh, Huicho pilgrimage with peyote down in deep in Mexico um, because it all ties together in the end. But you have to be very careful because there are people who don't know what they're doing. There are people who have had one or two experiences and think that they're now a guru. And uh, those kind of people are dangerous. So you do really have to pay attention. The, the best advice that I can give is to find somebody who's reputable through somebody else. You know, when, when I initially got dialed into this stuff, after 10 years of looking, I found somebody who had been going down into the Amazon for 15 years who was uh, well connected with people who had integrity and I was lucky enough and blessed enough to hook up with them and I've been working with them now for 15 years so uh, you have to be very very careful you have to watch who and what you're dealing with and, and the legalities around it are, are all uh, kind of blurry and gray, It's there's a lot of gray areas within it there are places, you know, it's, it's legal in Peru. And there's a church in the United States, um, the UDV. Uh, it's an ayahuasca church, which is legal which, by a Supreme Court uh, ruling. But you have to be, be, be very, very, very careful. And again, it's not for everybody. You know, the whole thing about shamanism, and particularly psychedelic shamanism, uh, and personal growth, for that matter, is that once you open a door, you can't close it. No. You know, I just, you know, I told that story about the abyss coming for me and coming for me until I finally dealt with it. You can't. So don't go around knocking on doors and opening them unless you're ready for what's going to come out, because sometimes it's a surprise that you don't want, but you got to deal with it. But um, having said that, in my own experience, I've knocked on lots of doors. I like, I like to characterizes I've knocked on spirit's door and then eventually over time spirit started knocking back and um, I was talking about the different altered states and the different you know places on the radio dial and all that and uh, in a shamanic viewpoint and what's happened in my life is that the sleeping and the waking and the dreaming all started to sort of meld into each other so that sort of the dreaming starts to come into the waking world and the waking world starts to go into the dreaming world. And um, that is actually an indigenous viewpoint. In, in indigenous tribes, whether you're sleeping or waking or dreaming, they all have just as much validity because it's real to you when it's happening. 
you know? Exactly. Yeah. Um, that was kind of a roundabout answer, but I hope I addressed the question. It, it seemed to. Um, it, and I've had, I've heard of the, the path, uh, the power path myself, and I've heard very good things about it. I actually did not do it, but I have heard of it. Um, there, yeah. there is, um, a lot of different ways, but yes, you do need, the more you find other people who have used a shaman in, um, in South America or Mexico, chance if they had a good experience you know that's the kind of thing that word of mouth is the best way to find someone is just ask around and see who, who you used um there is a woman um in sedona named um aluna joy who goes down oh, to yeah. peru um mm-hmm. quite a bit and she is an amazing woman so i i would trust her um with it, with getting a name or an idea of where to go as well if you're looking for someone to contact about that. Um, so yeah, with, with there, uh, understand, go on. I was just say, I'm, I'm familiar with her work. She seems pretty clean from what I've seen. And, and also, you know, there's, I think it's in July, there's actually an ayahuasca shamanism conference in Iquitos, Mexico. I'm, I'm sorry, Iquitos, Mexico, listen to me. Iquitos, Peru. Put on by a gentleman by the name of Alan Shoemaker, who has been down there for years, and that's a gathering of shamans and people and researchers and psychologists and things like that that go there. And that would also be a good place to tie into and get a good good information. Good information, and plus, to me, if it's got to resonate with you. Yes. That's As right. being the right person, it's it's just like an, another friend of mine. Um, is actually doing tours down. She's from Peru, and she's doing tours down there. And she's had many experiences um, of of with the shaman and Alaska. And her experience was very interesting in the fact that as she was doing one, she literally saw the shaman that was there within her dreamscape, her state. And when she came out, she she went to him and she, you needed my presence there, so I was there to support you. You needed to know a physical person was there with you in that moment. So, I mean, the shaman is really there for everyone in that circle. And, I mean, they're like holding the energy for you as well as the sitters from, the, from what I'm hearing. Is that correct? That is correct, and you just have to make sure you've got somebody who's reputable and knows what they're doing. I've heard horror stories about people who are not reputable and, uh, you know, taking advantage of women. Uh, you know, the thing is, when you when you do this and you go into a circle like that, you're becoming very vulnerable. Mm-hmm. So you have to make sure that somebody has integrity so that they will respect your vulnerability and not uh, take advantage I've, I've done healing work with people, and I've had women, like, fall in love with me, thinking I'm, like, the next thing to God because I helped them through a particular trauma or wound. And I have to respect them and say, you know, gee, thank you very much, but guess what? You Really, you did all the work. I'm just, I'm holding in the space, and I just happen to be the first person you looked at when you came out of that dark spot. But it's not me. It's you right. and it's spirit. You know, whereas someone else without integrity could take advantage of a woman in that state. And that, to me, is, like, to sound Catholic, that's a mortal sin, you know? Well, and that is something that you really need to be careful with, with any of the healing work that you do. Um, It's like my experience with the shamanic apprenticeship. The woman was, and I was lucky to clue into it, not too far into it, was not reputable. She wasn't, right. she was pretty evil, in fact. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, one of the other people that did complete the process was found dead in the desert because she tried yeah. to break away from this woman. I broke away um, pretty close to the beginning of it, though she did help me connect with animals in a very powerful way, even though I know I did the work. Um, it started out as very well, but then I just got the shadow feeling that was not 
good and experiences that threw me for a loop. And I said, I know this might be fear, but I also know I'm protecting me from a really bad direction. So I definitely knew that it was time for me to break from her. And I literally went to a dreamscape meditation. I had the elders with me. I had the animals with me. And I respectfully asked to be broken from the contract spiritually, physically, and on all levels. I wish her well, but this was not for me. Yeah. And, And so you really do need to. And she did take advantage. I was very vulnerable at that time. Um, and so it's like, I wrote the check for the final thing and I said, fine, I will write you off literally with this check. And it was, it was a really good lesson in discernment and trusting my instinct and knowing where to go and where not to go. So, um, it, you really do need to trust yourself. If something doesn't feel right, it isn't. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. That's right. But, you know, it brings up a good point. Um, I said it earlier that shamanism is all about mastering energy and mastering your personal energies. So when you start to do deep inner work, you begin to realize how particular, for lack of better words, how particular voices make you feel. If you suddenly find yourself all bent out of shape, and if you're paying attention, then you won't get swept up in it, and you will see, okay, I this thought or this feeling does not make me feel good. It gives me a bad feeling. That's an energy I do not want to cultivate. That's an energy I do not want to encourage. I want to shut that one off, and I want to find a different energy and a higher energy. And then you learn to navigate the energies. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's interesting when you talk about the animals and your experiences with that, because when you spend a lot of time in the jungle working with the plants, uh, the first thing you're doing is you're submitting yourself to the energies of that plant. Mm-hmm. And then by, you know, they call ayahuasca the mother of all the other plants. So there are a number of different plants that work with it. So you open yourself up to those energies and you learn the things that all those plants have to teach you. And once you've worked with those plants, you may never physically ingest them ever again but you have their energies uh, in your shamanism, their allies, and, and they're there for you to help you in a number of different ways. And when you continue to do ayahuasca, you'll also tap into animal energies. Mm-hmm. I've had some amazing uh, experiences of connecting with animals uh, on ayahuasca, which is, and they used to do that way back in prehistory, where uh, you you find yourself becoming resonant with particular animal energies. Mm-hmm. And you start to see the big picture of everything around you, the whole world and your whole reality are all energies. There's energies of relationships and you know, love and anger and this, that and the other thing. Even the weather, all the crazy weather we're having and then you look at what's going on within our consciousness. There are a lot of people in shamanism who say that the crazy weather is a reflection of what's going on inside of us. Yes. And, yes. You know, that's what we're doing to our environment. I mean, even in some of my meditations, and I have done actually some soul retrieval on myself through um, connecting with um, the jaguar and and helping to find different essences of me that through my childhood and other times have kind of like broken apart and said, I'm done with this. Um, So, or have been taken from me um, through a bad experience or something. So doing a soul retrieval, um, with animals has helped me tremendously. Um, and I do thank this woman who, for the shaman for that introduction with the animals because I really felt like I shifted into an eagle and saw the vision as an eagle does. Um, understand the, the energies of the otter, of a skunk, of a moose, um, a, a hummingbird, a wolf, yeah. and then as you look back, at least for me, when I look back in my life and how much animals have been really there for me, and even looking at my dogs as the teacher, mm-hmm. has really right. and having respected them and gather their inner energies and their lessons from them and how they're, re- they're reflecting myself back at me. 
yeah, and learning from right. that experience. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. I've, um, I've been through a number of animals. Originally, it's interesting, Wild Wolf Spirit Radio, and my first totem that I knew of was wolf. And I, I like the kid people that I've been working on. I like to get in touch with my inner dog. Yes. But um, I've also been through serpents and insects and things like that. And then I had some wonderful experiences with a condor. Um, and then that evolved into the hummingbird. And the hummingbird is my primary totem. As a matter of fact, my email is picaflor, um, which is Spanish. They use it in Peru. Picar is to bite and flor is flower. Um, but it's a hummingbird. And, and it's been, I've had amazing, amazing hummingbird experiences on ayahuasca. And they are my primary um, totem now, my primary ally. I have a number of them, but um, that's my biggest one. And it is all through uh, experiencing them directly, energetically, uh, through the plants, which is uh, quite enlightening. Uh, yeah. Another thing is, you know, interesting, uh, along the lines of, for lack of better words, uh, charlatans. Is I have this discussion frequently. I I'm a student of shamanism. I am uh, passionate about it. I do shamanic practices, but I don't call myself a shaman. Other people do, and if they want to do that, that's fine. I don't. And there's a lot of people running around, and they go and they just they they they've had one or two experiences or something, and they they get their business card and put a shaman on it, and they get a business card. Hi, I'm a shaman. You know, and for me, it's like you better run in the other direction when you see that. Right. Because uh, most ego. of them don't want to even be really known or seen. You know? It's not, but yeah, it's an ego thing, exactly. Um, but humility is one of the best things you can you can learn on this path. That's yeah, sure. it, it's it's true. And, and for one of my birthdays, I actually held a hummingbird. Mm. Um, and, and it actually went into its hibernation state because it was so cold. I, I was born in December, so it was a really cold day and one had fallen off and I was like praying that it was alive. So I took it inside the house and I'm petting it saying, please live, please live. And it came back and to feel the, the heartbeat of a mm. hummingbird and to see its eyes open and see its tongue. And it's just sitting in your hand with the utmost trust in love was like yeah. one of the greatest experiences I think I ever will have. That was a great birthday for me. <laughs> I'm jealous. Um, so I've actually held a hummingbird three or four times. So um, wow. I, I feel very blessed, and it definitely is a an ally and a friend of mine. I, I live in a place where there's hummingbirds always buzzing around me. So um, I, And it's the joy of life, so you can't have a better one. Um, I, I've studied um, and took some classes about animal energy with Ted Andrews, who oh, to yeah. me is, uh, he's wonderful. And I was very blessed to meet him and have a couple of conversations with him about animal energies and connecting and the pure essence of the love that they are here to share with us. Um, if we learn how to be more like the animals and the plants, and we would be in such a better place. I couldn't agree more. Um, one of the things I've discovered in connecting with animals is that you really have to do it on their terms. Mm -hmm. you, you have you have to like sort of surrender yourself over to them and say, okay, you're in charge, tell me what to do kind of a thing. And then they're okay with that, but it, it really has to be on their terms. I had a, yeah. a friend tell me a while back, which I love it, she said, hummingbirds are the nerve endings of God. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. I that's awesome. Yeah, I love that. That's one of my uh, my faves. I can tell you a gazillion hummingbird stories. Every time I've ever done a wilderness solo in my shamanic studies, I've had one come right up to me and get in my face. It's, it's just that's right. checking in. Yep. Yeah. How you I, doing there, I, dude? I would, yeah. And and it's it's interesting if you know it's like to have a wild lizard come and sit on you. It's like a rescued one out of the pool. And I was looking through my one of my writings and I wrote about it and. He clinged to me for like 15 minutes. He was just walking around in me, and it's like, okay, dream time and absorbing the energy of the lizard. So it, it's the, they make you very present to the moment yes. and really put you in that now moment that just 
light you up and really appreciate with great gratitude what's around you. Even if it's like a horrible place and it's dirty and musty, you know, you just, you see the beauty within it. I, I, yeah. it's, that's the way it's, it's made me see, and it may be just because of my, my way of being the darkness to see the brightest of bright, the light, um, and understand that compassion that even though you might be in a really dark place, there's a blessing within it. There's something to learn, to embrace, to understand that's going to put you in a much better place once you embrace it and, and let it absorb into you with the pureness of, of truth that it's holding for you. Um, mm-hmm. and it's, it's just been a very interesting experience to really open that up and understand that's around you. Um, so your experiences, and we, we got more time, but your experiences yeah. with plants have opened my, and my curiosity because I really mm-hmm. feel that you really need to delve into all areas of nature in some way to fully embrace all of you. Um, so I'm getting more and more curious about doing more plant work and and our work in a lot of different ways. So with your with your experiences, um, would you call yourself an herbalist? Hmm. Yeah, I've always been an herbalist. You know, I was I was a vegetarian for 23 years, um, and then when I went into the jungle and did this shamanic plant diet, uh, part of it was chicken and fish, and I wanted to experience it exactly the way that they did it because they knew things about bodily chemistry that would boggle your mind. So I ate some chicken and fish when I was doing the the, uh, dieta, and I realized that I felt a little better that way. So now I eat some chicken and fish, but most of what I do, I I take it, you know, I don't take any medications, but I take uh, a number of supplements that are all Mm plant-based. And there's, uh, I've always been, you know, fascinated to me, Chinese medicine, Chinese herbalism is really, it's just shamanism. Yes, it is. Um, you know, as well as acupuncture, uh, tied directly in with that, it, it's all about energy. So the different energies of the plants affect you in different ways. And when I do the, the plant diets, and as I say, I, I, I do the ayahuasca when I'm on those diets, but I also work with a number of other plants. I'm embracing those different energies and, it, and every plant. I may use the bark of one plant, a root of another one, a leaf of another one, and they all have a different gift to give to me. And, um, you know, I've gotten grief from people who didn't understand, but when you go into the jungle and you do a plant dieta, it is more often than not an ordeal, and more often than not there's a great deal of physical discomfort. And what they say in the lore of the jungle and shamanism that the the discomfort and the ordeal that you go through is the price that the plants are making you pay in order to prove that you're worthy of the knowledge that they have to give you. Mm-hmm. And I'm uh, in in my experience, I I couldn't agree with that more. That's been very uh, powerful. And the more I've had to go through some tough ordeals, uh, ultimately, I'm better off in the end. Although it may not seem like it at the time. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. and it's there's a lot of people that are experiencing depression, and they think, oh, they got to get on some antidepressants. To me, I I I was because of a situation I was in, I was on um, an antidepressant for a year, and I absolutely hated it. I felt so numbed out and so not me. Though at the time I was married and he loved it because I wasn't emotional at all. I was so even keeled that he had better control of me, as he said. Um, yeah. And as soon as I said, no, I'm not taking it anymore. It's, it, it's not what I want. It, boy, was he not happy about that. <laughs> and yes, yeah. I managed it in soon after that. But it, it's, it's to me, if I had those moments of depression, I get out my journal and say, okay, what's this about? What am I, what's, what am I supposed to learn? And it is really a blessing to have those moments of 
sadness because if you're grieving, a lot of times for me, I get these feelings of death and wanting to die. And to me, it's just an aspect of me that no longer needs to be here that mm-hmm. I need to let go of. And mm-hmm. instead of, and I just flow with it. It might not be the best thing at the moment. Like you said, it isn't always happy, but um, I know that I'm learning from it. Yeah, that, that brings up a really interesting point. Um, for one, um, a caveat, any dealings, if anybody has any dealings with ayahuasca, antidepressants are a major, major, major no-no. You can really damage yourself if you were to do antidepressants in ayahuasca, which fascinates me on other levels because Antidepressants basically stifle everything. It does not solve the problem. It just throws a blanket over it, but it festers and it festers. Oh, when you go, go for ahead. me, I, I became more obsessive about what was wrong. Yeah, and not what was right. But, yeah, because it, it won't go away. I mean, like there are people who are alcoholics, right? And then they quit the alcohol. And they go to AA or whatever they happen to do on their path. And then they're eating tons of sugar. So they've shifted their addiction to alcohol, which is sugar-based anyway, to a sugar addiction. Or, you know, and I'm not basing on AA or, any, or NA or anything like that, but you go to meet, you know, in a meeting there and um, people are smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee like banshees because you can shift the, you know, the addiction is really just a symptom of the deeper cause. And when you get to the core of it, then those other things will fall away. But it's typically never fun to go to the core of it. you got to pay the dues and face, face, pay the piper and, you know, uh, face the darkness like you say. You look into yourself and you go, why is this? And then you, you go and you, you follow that feeling down to where it's coming from and figure it out. So, and, and I wasn't really able to do it while I was on the depression um, antidepressants, right. and as soon as I let go of it, um, it cleared up almost immediately. But that was also a time that my intuition really started to amp up, which is it was um, a time that I was going through a sexual harassment deal at work. And um, and the guy who had done this to me, I mean, the, the games that that whole business was playing on me was just like, Amazing! I was actually laughing at him because I could see everything ahead of what they were going to do. Yeah. So it's just following yeah, yeah. it through, and and it was amazing what they thought they were going to get rid of. You know how they were planning this this giant scheme to kick me out and bury me, and and even the justice system kind of went along, even though the person said she didn't agree with what they did. They had covered their bases enough to get away with it. Mm-hmm. Which is sad, but, you know, it was an experience that helped me understand how perverse the legal system is in this country. Oh, boy, you just, yeah. We could spend six hours just on that. Oh, oh, they were asking the name of your supplements that you're using. Is there a brand name uh, associated with all of them, or are there just a mixture? Yeah. With the supplements that you're taking, is it? You know, is there one brand that you're taking that's oh. really plant-based that you mentioned that um, is helping you? Well, the best thing that I've found is an organization called Life Extension. Um, if you just do lef.org, and Life Extension is a, a nonprofit collective of anti-aging researchers, and they... Do the, they, they take a lot of the money they get. Uh, it's like 45 bucks a year, and then you get a discount on your supplements. And they do a lot of research. They fund a lot of anti-aging research. So they, they were, uh, when people started getting, like when CoQ10 became a big deal, I'm pretty sure they were the first ones to say that CoQ10 was something. And so they have articles and studies that um, will... Uh, They'll, they'll, they'll give an article on a particular qualities of particular plants, like for argument's sake, curcumin, which is a great anti-inflammatory. 
and um, then they'll, they'll you'll, you'll get a, a, a five-page article, and then you'll get four pages of studies that back up what they said in the article, and then they'll make the supplements to um, work together for maximum bioavailability and uh, maximal absorption, and, and, you know, they say this dosage with this study got these results. And so they'll publish all that, and then they'll market the supplements. And again, it's it's a it's a nonprofit, and I really uh, I've written about them. I've done a lot of work with them, and it's a really big organization now. And they do they they do a, they call them um, nutraceuticals, which are basically uh, supplements that are uh, manufactured to pharmaceutical cleanliness and specifications and, uh, and exactness. And so they've done some really good work, and I've seen some uh, amazing results with their studies. Um, so I would, anybody who's interested in that, I would strongly suggest. I call it 21st Century. I wrote, in fact, I wrote a big article about it. Um, it's on my website. And what is your website? Uh, yeah, my website is www mattalamary.com so that's um, M as in Mary A T T P as in Paul A L L A M as in Mary A R Y dot com and uh, there are this podcast and videos and pictures and essays and lots of stuff there but one of my did is called the spirit the spiritual dimension of life extension and I talk about the fact that what they're doing with these plant-based supplements are uh, it's basically uh, what I characterize as 21st century shamanism. Uh, so they're, they're very, very good. I also have a great doctor here who's very forward-thinking. He has a Center for Advanced Medicine in Encinitas, California, Dr. Mark Drucker, and he's an expert on chlorella, which is also another very good supplement. Now, I've been hearing a lot about that. Um, Isogenix is now coming out um, with that, which is another thing that is, um, I've had good results with it. Um, though it's always good, I always try route other things. You can never do that, um, have too much experience with it. But that is a very big kind of buzzword these days, isn't it? Which word? The, the words you mentioned. It's about, um, helping stop the aging of the cells, correct? Uh, uh, Anti-inflammatory? Anti uh, I'm talking about, is it quinella? Oh, chlorella, chlorella. Well, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, chlorella. Yeah, my, my uh, doctor, um, Dr. Drucker, is the leading spokesman for chlorella, and it's um, this, what he, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it's a cell wall of this algae that's grown in very, very clean uh, environment, and it's um, very high in protein, and it's also a uh, heavy metal chelator. It, it draws heavy metals and then helps to pass them through your body. Um, so it's very uh, cleansing and purifying. Sun, sun chlorella, that's what it is. Yeah, sun chlorella. He's actually written a couple of books on it. Um, awesome. Yeah, yeah. And he's in the, uh, the Center for Advanced Medicine in, in Antonius, California, where I go. Um, the other thing I do, I'm, I'm aging, like all of us, and I do a, a bit of uh, hormone therapy under his supervision. Um, and he does a really good job of making me get blood tests periodically and checking in and making sure all the blood chemistry is at its uh, maximum potential. So there's now, a little bit of that. Is he an MD or an ND? He's an MD. Okay. But, you know, he does, he does these cleanses. He does acupuncture, uh, chiropractic, but he is a, he's a practicing MD and, uh, very cutting edge. Like I say, his organization is called the Center for Advanced Medicine. Um, if anybody Googled that, they could find him there and they, they have their own deal of supplements and everything there. He does a great job. He's really, really uh, smart guy. <laughs> I'm lucky to have him. Yes, indeed. 
Um, now we have about 10 minutes left. Is okay. there anything that you would like to cover or mention? Like, are you speaking anywhere? Are you um, having any workshops? Is there yeah. anything you want to talk about? Sure. I'm actually heading out tomorrow, um, this coming weekend. Actually, starting on Saturday is the Santa Barbara Writers Conference. And I'll be there for six days teaching my – it's fantastic fiction. Uh, and it's fantastic spelled with a P-H. And it's literature of the visionary, supernatural, metaphysical, horror, fantasy, and science fiction. And I'll be doing that for um, just about a week. It's six days long. And then um, right after that, I have my, uh, the Infinity Zone there, which won the International Book Award, is a finalist in the San Diego Book Award. So right after that, June 22nd, um, there's a ceremony, a dinner here in San Diego. I'll find out how that goes. And then I just signed on yesterday, and I don't have the information, but if people look on Facebook or go to my webpage, I'll be posting it in the next day or two. There's another mini writers conference. Uh, it's going to be in Glendale, I think. And I think it's something like uh, July 22nd. But don't quote me on that date. But that's coming up, so I'll be lecturing there on um, and doing a panel on uh, memoir writing. I've also, uh, my novel, Land Without Evil, is, um, about the first contact between the Jesuits and the Indians in South America, but it's told from the Indians' point of view, and it's all about shamanism. And I was blessed to be involved. It was made into an acrobatic aerial stage show in Austin, Texas, uh, mm -hmm. in December. We did eight shows. We sold out opening night and closing two nights, and it was 20 people in the cast and 30 people in the crew, and it was acrobatics and visuals and video projection and costumes, really amazing. Um, and the making of the show was um, recorded for a show called Arts in Context, a PBS show. Oh, so they beautiful. made a show about the making of the show. I am going to be premiering the video of the entire show at the Santa Barbara Writers Conference on June 11th. Uh, which is a Tuesday night, about 9 o'clock, in the main uh, ballroom at the Hyatt there where the conference is. So if anybody's around, that, that event is open to the public in Santa Barbara. Um, and then I've got a million writing projects, which I won't get into. Okay. The, 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 the thing that you're doing in Glendale, is that California or Arizona? Oh, thank you. No, it's California. Um, it's something like... The Pacific Writers Institute. Uh, I might be able to find it here while I'm uh, looking on email. Um, we'll see. But it's it's a gathering. It's not necessarily a, a writers' conference, but um, it's uh, more. Um, how do you put it? Uh, Presentations, it's panels and speakers, it's literary agents and editors and things like that. It's not, at Santa Barbara, I'm going to be doing more of a straight up uh, writing workshop. So, um, is the so Glendale is like a round table, would you say? Well, it's going to be big. I guess it's going to be like, I think there's going to be maybe uh, 150 people uh, included in the. Um, the, uh, how can I put it? More of an assembly almost. Kind of thing. Okay. It sounds like good uh, fun. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to find. I've got it. I've got my tablet here. I don't have my, my uh, computers in the other room, but I was trying to find something coherent here um, so that I can give you the right information, but it's not coming up easily. But again, if people come to my. Uh, a workshop, then, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> my website, then they can see the information. I just I just signed on for it yesterday, so that's why I'm not uh, as kind as I should be. It, it's, um, but I'm sure a lot more opportunities are opening up 
um, for you, you know, for the rest of the year. And going to your website, they can keep connected to you and also on Facebook. Um, yep. So the blessing of social media. Um, yeah. Keeping in touch with everything can be overwhelming. Um, any final wisdoms that you want to share about either plant wisdom, shamanism, writing, um, a mix of all of it? Well, I'll just say that we are all creators. Um, when you go knocking on doors, if you go knocking and they open, there's no turning back. And by all means, proceed with caution and awareness. And if you have integrity and you really hold truth to be dear in your heart, then you will always turn out your benefit, even when they seem to be uncomfortable or totally against you. If you have the right attitude, you'll come to understand that no matter what happens to you, good or bad, it's all a blessing. I think that's a good ending spot. Awesome. So I thank you very, very much for this enlightening two hours. Um, I, I really am quite happy that uh, we had this conversation, and I know we will continue to, to stay in touch. Um, a lot of people have enjoyed this program, I'm sure. So, uh, Matthew Palomari, I thank you and many blessings to you, my friend. Thank you, Jennifer, and, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have to agree with your producer. You're a beautiful mirror. Oh, why, well, thank you very much. Um, and so this is Jennifer Hellman saying if you want to continue such beautiful conversations with people like Matt, um, please donate to Wolf Spirit Radio. We greatly, greatly appreciate everything. Um, a lot of things are expanding and moving forward. Um, with Wolf Spirit, and we need to make sure that Dear Dave, Master of the Wolf Pack, can continue it. So if you can donate, go to Wolf Spirit Radio and donate. There's a, a button right on the page. Um, I also want to thank everybody in the chat room who has assisted me on the show by asking questions. I appreciate you guys there. And if you would like to get in touch with me, it's the best place is either Angels Intuition or JenniferHillman.com. Um, I will be going up to Mount Shasta soon to be joining um, three wonderful healers and um, masters of the universe. So I will be joining them. I will be actually doing one show on the road um, and then... Um, one of the shows I'm actually passing over to Ted Gracio, who was um, a guest recently. He's going to take over because he wants the experience of being on radio. So I thank you very much. I will be doing um, private sessions at Mount Shasta as well if you're interested in connecting a little deeper with yourself. Um, more information on Angel's Intuition if you would like to check that out. So with that, this is Jennifer Hellman wishing you all a beautiful, beautiful week. Connect with nature. Um, there's really intense energies with the planets right now and just everywhere else. And understand that that shadow might be peeking out to help you embrace the very nature of who you truly are even more so. So you can shine even, even more so, like they said, you know, the the pressure of coal becomes a diamond, and we're all here to become those diamonds. So with that, this is Jennifer Hellman saying, Adios from Abstract Illusion Radio. You're listening to Wolf Spirit Radio.